Welcome to our Bible study uh, for this fall and to getting to read together the book of 2 Corinthians. You may be wondering why 2 Corinthians when we haven't read 1 Corinthians, and I think that's a very legitimate question. I wanted this fall to read an epistle together since we've done a gospel and we've done a book from the Old Testament. And I sort of was racking my brain as to what epistle would introduce us well to the genre of reading epistles and what might actually speak to us in our time. So I landed on 2 Corinthians, which is a little bit odd since we haven't read 1 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians is 13 chapters long, and we'll be reading that together over eight sessions this fall. But why? Why this particular epistle? Well, I, I like it because it, as all epistles, is written from a particular person to a particular group of people. And often it can be difficult when we read, read an epistle to remember that. It, we can get kind of drawn into the narrative and it sounds like the author is speaking to us personally and very directly, and sometimes it feels rather authoritatively. And it can be difficult to maintain the distance of, of, of the perspective that, oh wait, this wasn't actually written to me or to our church at our time. It was written to another group of people. Um, on the other hand, it's important to be able to engage these epistles as if they really are scripture and inspired by the Holy Spirit. So 2 Corinthians is written from Paul, the Apostle Paul, um, to the church at Corinth. And it's a follow-up letter to, uh, uh, to 1 Corinthians that he had written to the same group of people. But in 2 Corinthians, he's much more personal. We get to meet Paul much more as the human. And he speaks of his personal struggles. He speaks actually about his feelings and uh, some of the, the things that he's been wrestling through. And he speaks to the Corinthians as people. It's a book or letter that's much less about particular issues and practices and how they should be behaving as followers of Christ. It's almost as if Paul steps away from the, the podium or the lectern and sits down face to face with his friends um, and so it allows us a glimpse more into his humanity than I think any of his other writings do, um, and also appeals to the Corinthians as also humans, as people in whom, with whom he is in relationship, actually a relationship that's been tested and strained, uh, but has been a very strong and intimate relationship. And so we get sort of a, an intimate glimpse into Paul's mind and his heart and his struggles and into this very important relationship that he's sort of trying to pull back together. And so we, um, we're drawn into this letter and it's easier to remember that it is a letter not written to us. And so we get to be the observers who listen in on this conversation that's been going on. And it's a very... Um, emotional conversation. But as we listen to it, we get to listen to some pretty brilliant theology going on. And it's theology coming out of Paul um, grappling with some of his own experiences that have happened, some, some deep, deep sufferings that he's been through that have really rattled him to the core. And some would even suggest that he may have had a bit of a, a mental breakdown, an emotional breakdown. And You'll hear it in the tone of his letter as he's struggling through what it means to be a follower of Christ, what it means to be a minister of the gospel, what it means to be human living in a body that that um, is finite, a body that suffers, a body that is facing possible death, a body that um, has limits even to its emotional and mental capacity, and yet uh, a body that is inhabited by the glorious Holy Spirit of Christ. And so he's living in these tensions, in these struggles, also uh, to be human in relationship with other humans, where how they think of him and how they respond to him affects him very, very deeply and very personally. And yet he's supposed to be their apostle and have this ministry to them, and yet he needs them to be his friends. And so this, this um, letter... Um, 
plays out all of that uh, and in kind of in a spiraling manner where he picks up on these themes and keeps returning back to them and then moving on to another one and then to another one, but they all keep getting woven together through the course of the letter. So we get a glimpse into Paul as a man, as a mystic, as someone who's had some profound encounters in the spiritual realm with the Holy Spirit and who's also very conscious of uh, of the evil spirit who's seeking to oppose him and oppose the people that he's loved he loves and even getting in it has gotten into some of their heads in turning them against him and we also get a glimpse into Paul the missionary who is um sort of giving an account for his ministry and for his life as he's pretty aware that he's probably coming to the end of it and he's looking back and making sense of those things so a little background on what had happened in this letter. Some of it's still mysterious to us, but Paul had lived in Corinth in this city for 18 months. And we get a description of that in Acts chapter 18, if you want to look at it and kind of get a, a historical account of Paul's ministry in Corinth. Um, in fact, it was in Corinth that he met Priscilla and Aquila, who ended up becoming his co-ministers in Ephesus, where he went later on. And it's from Ephesus that we know Paul wrote 1 Corinthians, his first letter to the Corinthians. And, and that letter is a very instructive letter. It's clearly in response to something that some of the people from Corinth had written to him. So we catch him in a rather debated conversation, uh, rather heated conversation with the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians about how they should live um, sort of correcting some excesses, some false teachings, some bad practices, some conflict that had come in. So 1 Corinthians sounds very much like Paul the Apostle writing to teach and instruct and encourage the flock that he feels a level of responsibility for. But something has happened uh, between the writing of that first letter to first uh, Corinthians and the writing of second Corinthians. And all of a sudden we meet a Paul who is, um, who's been really shaken. His confidence is gone. Uh, his authoritative demeanor is, is completely gone. And he's almost like a shaking child begging his friends to let him back into their hearts. And he's telling them, kind of explaining his actions, explaining some decisions that he had to take. Um, clearly, they have misunderstood him and a rift has come in their relationship and it has rattled him to the core. Um, and so when we when we read this book, we read themes of his themes of suffering come through and he's actually opening up about his sufferings and describing them and referring to some sufferings maybe that the Corinthian believers have gone through. But then along with suffering, he talks about comfort, about consolation, about encouragement, about um, even confidence that comes in the midst of those sufferings. We definitely hear themes of finitude, Paul aware more than ever. Um, of how limited he is, how frail he is. He talks a lot about weakness. He talks about his body wasting away. And so you even hear him kind of coming to grips with aging, coming to grips with perhaps depression and um, meant some mental illness, coming to grips with physical weakness and, and the limits of what he uh, is able to bear up under. And yet in the midst of addressing his finitude and, and our finitude, he talks about finding strength. He talks about the power of God. He talks about the glory of this treasure that's living in our finite human bodies. And then we also hear Paul talking about conflict, about a relation, relationships that break down and, and, and become strained and, and the ministry of reconciliation. And, and a lot of what we're seeing him do in this letter is grapple with his own humanity in light of the presence of the Holy Spirit and with his own relationships. Um, on one hand, defending himself to these friends who seem to have misunderstood him and been offended by him or hurt by him and sort of have distanced themselves from, from him. He's giving a an explanation of his ministry, of his decisions, of his actions, almost in a really kind of backfooted, defensive sort of way. But it's it's an appeal to them to understand him and to let him back into their hearts. 
At the same time, and I find this very interesting, we find Paul affirming these believers, these Corinthian believers, more than exhortation and pastoral counseling, we hear him affirming them as his fellow saints, his fellow believers, as ones in whom the Holy Spirit also dwells. And it's almost like as he reaches the end of his ministry on earth, but also is interacting with believers who have matured in their faith, he's moved from being the apostle, the great leader, to being a friend who along with them is appealing to the presence of the Holy Spirit in both of them and the power of the Holy Spirit to teach each of them, to convict and to convince each of them. And so it's almost like the locus of authority has moved from him as their teacher to the Holy Spirit whom he's encouraging them to listen to and even affirming their capacity to hear from and respond to. So it's almost like a very mature leader speaking to mature followers, mature saints, more like peers and friends. And it sounds very much to me like Jesus speaking to his disciples the night before he died, saying, I no longer call you servants, but friends. And in this conversation, we get the opportunity to listen in, um, to listen to the things that Paul has discovered along the way, and to receive his encouragement to these friends as encouragement to us as we also bear that same spirit within us and seek to be followers and disciples of the same Christ. So how will we read this letter together? We'll, we'll just go progressively through the letter. Um, and I will again give uh, questions for you to consider as you're reading and thinking about it. And then we'll come together and, and use those discussions as a fra uh, questions as a framework for our discussion. And I hope that like the Apostle Paul, not, not to compare myself to him, um, my role will simply be to facilitate your capacity to listen to the Holy Spirit as the Spirit speaks to you through Scripture and as the Holy Spirit to, speaks to you from within yourself. There's one other bit of background that I'd encourage you to, to consider, um, and it's not ever made explicit in the in the book of 2 Corinthians, but it seems to me that as Paul is grappling with his own experience, he's doing so with the backstory of Moses when he went up on Mount Sinai and received the law from God, but then also had this direct face-to-face -face encounter, this mystical encounter with, with the Spirit of God on Mount Sinai. It's almost like Paul is reflecting on his ministry and his experiences of God in light of Moses' ministry and Moses' experiences of God. And I kind of have a hypothesis that Paul is making sense of his life in the context of the story of Moses' life. And I think he's feeling a lot of resonance with Moses in some of his experiences, including the ways that Moses um, represented God and brought the teaching of God to the people, but also the way the people didn't always understand Moses and even constantly questioned his authority. And I wonder if Paul is sort of finding a friend in the Old Testament Moses as he tries to make sense of, of his life at this point. And that sort of opens for us the opportunity to become friends with Paul <laughs> as he's being friends with Moses. So if you'd like to look also a little bit at Exodus 33 and 34, just to refresh your memory of that story of Moses in his encounter with God on Mount Sinai, it may sort of help us get a little glimpse into what Paul has been experiencing in his encounters with God, um, maybe not on a physical mountain, but his encounters with God in prayer and in contemplation, and also in um, immersing himself in scripture. So let Paul be perhaps our older brother, our mentor, as he leads us into a deeper encounter with the Lord Jesus, and uh, as he walks the path ahead of us into glory. <laughs>